Welcome to the Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mugala, where I interview violinists from around the world. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast for future episodes. My guest today is a Baroque violinist based in New York City and has earned violin performance degrees from Temple University's Boyer College of Music, Manhattan School of Music, and the Juilliard School for Historical Performance. In 2018, she made her Lincoln Center debut as a soloist and has performed internationally on tours to Europe, India, and New Zealand. Please let me welcome Sarah Jane Kenner. Thanks for for joining us today, Sarah. How are you doing? Good to see you. Nice to talk to you today. Good to see you too. How are you? I'm doing Thanks okay. For me. Yeah, before the before the podcast, we were just t- talking a little bit, and we're, I'm just so glad I have my coffee. <laughs> I'm so glad I got my coffee, and I'm, I'm I'm ready to get this conversation going because I'm I want to pick your mind, and and for people who are listening from around the world may not know who you are, uh, but actually a lot of people do because you're actually uh, the hungry musician on Instagram. So That's me. here we are. Yeah. And I definitely want to talk about your food blog <laughs> later on, but let's first, let's, uh, let's get to know you first. Um, how did you get started with the violin? How did Baroque violin kind of get into your life? And maybe we'll steer the conversation from there. Sure. Uh, so I, I started playing um, when I was um, a little before I turned five. And um, the way that I started with it was actually um, my mom was a, um, an English teacher at the time. And one of her students was a violinist who uh, ended up on TV doing something. I think she was, she was playing backup um, for a a singer on TV. And so my mom, she's like, Oh, I have to watch my student. um, Cause she's, she's going to be on TV. And I vividly remember it's one of my earliest memories, like sitting on the floor of our den and watching this student of hers play on TV. And it wasn't even anything like super special, you know, it was, I think it was very special for, for this <laughs> student, but, you know, it wasn't anything like super flashy or classical. It was just, you know, a violin backup for a singer. And I just remember being totally mesmerized by the sound. And I asked my parents for lessons. Um, and I was so impatient to start lessons and to get my violin that I started pretending to play on chopsticks. So that was my my entry into the violin world. Yeah, it's um, almost like if you're a Suzuki <laughs> student, right? There you get you get the cardboard box and you get like the 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 wooden bow, like it's like a big stick, right? <laughs> it's kind of yeah. similar to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember my my very first violin lesson when my teacher came to uh, introduce herself and to you know meet us, and I was so excited to show off what I had been practicing, and I, I played her a little something on my chopsticks. <laughs> Um, That's amazing. Yeah, I so, love that. I love that. Yeah. Just um, did, did the did the instrument that you had, did it have strings on it? Was it kind of like, like that cardboard violin where it was just, just, you're just making like cardboard sounds or did it have strings on it? Oh no, it was literally just chopsticks, like take just, out chopsticks. Just take out chopsticks. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm Nothing sure fancy. you had like, I'm sure you had like amazing form, you know, because it's, yeah. You know. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so, so that was sort of my entry into violin. And then, um, it was really, you know, it was a big part of my life, but I, I didn't really think about doing it professionally until, um, high school and, uh, pretty late into high school, actually. Um, you know, when I started thinking about college, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go into music because I really loved it, but I, I didn't know if, you know, I wanted to dedicate my entire life to it yet. Um, But it became pretty clear as I started, you know, preparing for auditions that this actually really was what I wanted to do. Um, And so um, I think I I probably had a little bit of a different approach to it than than a lot of other conservatory students um, in that, you know, I wasn't really sure yet. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I I went to a university first because um, I, I wanted to have the flexibility of well, if I, you know, try it and it turns out that I really just want to keep it as a, you know, a passion and not as a career as well, then I'll have some flexibility and, you know, changing. But obviously there was no need, you know, for that flexibility because (laughs) I was just so happy um, having that as my career path. Um, And while I was at Temple University, um, I ended up taking, in my junior year, I took a history course that was dedicated to the life and music of Bach, uh, J.S. Bach. And I... Not the CPE Bach. Not about, we're not about that life. We're about the granddaddy J.S. Bach. 
We're about that. We we love CPE too, but I just wanted to specify because <laughs> Yeah, for all the oh. for all the violin nerds listening to the podcast and us included. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so and I just remember at the time, you know, I I knew about period instruments, I knew about historical performance, but it wasn't really a thing that I I knew a ton about and uh, I didn't know the scope of, you know, performance practice and, you know, all, all of that. It just, it wasn't really on my radar. And so I took this course and the professor who taught the course, um, he himself, um, is a Baroque flutist. And so all of his examples that he showed in class of recordings and all that, they were of, um, period instrument ensembles or soloists, um, you know, singers that, uh, specialize in early music. And I just remember being totally enthralled by the sound world and everything. I was like, whoa, this is something I want to do. And um, Temple was a really good place to be because they had a lot of people there specializing in early music. Philadelphia has a really, really wonderful early music scene. Um, and so it, it was it was just kind of a, a perfect setup for me. And I ended up taking the next semester, a historical performance practice course. So it was a little bit more, um, it was a little bit more specialized to the actual performance of early music, um, and the research. And it, it was so cool to me how all of this music I loved, not even just early music could be, could fall under the umbrella of historical performance. And I've always been a history nerd. So the idea of, you know, doing research and then, uh, you know, shaping your performance so that it is, you know, something like it could have been at that time was really, really fascinating to me. So um, that was how I got into it. And then that summer I went to the Aspen Music Festival where there isn't really a lot of <laughs> historical yeah i was just gonna i was just gonna say that aspen doesn't have that much broke ensembles like uh, they don't have that right. many programs that they offer in terms of historical performance so well, what did you right. did you go to aspen for contemporary violin or and then you had your broke violin with you and you played a little bit yeah so well sort of i'll, I'll kind of it's it's I'll try to condense the story, but it's, <laughs> so I, I applied to Aspen before Baroque violin was even on my radar. Um, and I, I went for the full eight weeks and, you know, I went in at the time, my goal was to be an orchestra player. And I was so excited, you know, eight weeks of really intense orchestra, really intense lessons. I was working on a Prokofiev concerto at the time. Like I, th this stuff was not really on, on, my radar as like a, a potential career. It was on my radar, like I'm really into this and like I wanna, you know, make this something I do, but it wasn't like, I'm gonna pivot everything I'm already working on. And while I was there, they, um, at, at the end of the, the program, like in the final week of the program, they, they were doing a Monteverdi opera in the opera center. And they had sent out an email to everyone saying, hey, who has experience with period instruments? And I didn't really, like I had fiddled around with the bow a little bit, but I, I wasn't taking lessons. I wasn't experienced yet. But I said yes, because I, I wanted to try it. And um, when we got to rehearsal, um, it, it, the project was directed by Jane Glover, um, who is an incredible, um, director conductor um and you know i don't think i realized like whose presence i was in <laughs> and so i came in like yay i'm gonna play some you know gonna play some monteverdi casual yeah <laughs> I was like, let's go guys and i got there and i was like oh these people they really this is this pros. is the real deal and, <laughs> yeah and they had flown in people in from new york um professionals to you know play at continuo and i you know, I, I think that they realized that the the violinists from the program didn't quite have the experience that they thought they did. So they they brought in um, a violinist from New York, uh, Leah Nelson, who ended up coaching us for two weeks, like really intensive Baroque style string playing. And she ended up becoming like my teacher and mentor in New York 
um, before I went to Juilliard. Um, even while I was at Juilliard, I still continued to play for her. And now that I'm out of Juilliard, I, I still play for her. So that was kind of officially my induction into the Baroque world was at Aspen. Yeah, into enough. the Baroque niche. Yeah. But you, you mentioned something very interesting because while you were doing this Monteverdi opera, I think little do we know, or for anyone who's listening, that the, the Baroque style is completely different uh, in terms of technique, playing style, as we're, you know, as our ears are really used to, you know, in the 21st century, right? And even looking back on, you know, recordings from 20th century, it's still very different. And uh, the Baroque style, I, I love, I love Baroque violin. I've never really tried it, but hopefully one day I get to. I feel like I have such a huge wingspan for as a, like a violist. People tell me I should be a violist, but I love violin. Sorry, <laughs> violists out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, talk about your journey through uh, Baroque violin. What kind of opportunities have it, uh, did it give you? And um, and wh why, do you, why do you enjoy Baroque violin so much? Why, why not just stick to contemporary? Um, well, I think I've always been the kind of person who doesn't like to, you know, go on the beaten path. I like to go do my own thing a little bit. And, um, you know, when I graduated Temple, I still was kind of under the, even though I had already begun, you know, taking lessons on Baroque violin and I really, really loved it, I was not yet committed to making it my career. So I did my first master's at Manhattan School of Music. And while I was there, um, I, you know, I was, I was doing all the things that I, I loved. I was playing an orchestra, playing Strauss and, you know, Mahler, Bruckner, whatever, like all these, you know. All not... like the late romantic <laughs> symphonies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, working on like Tchaikovsky concerto and I was having fun, but, you know, on the side, I was still continuing to study with my teacher in New York, um, my Baroque teacher in New York. And I was doing some, you know, workshops and activities on the side with Baroque Violin. And um, it reached a point when I was about to graduate Manhattan School with my master's. Um, it was like the, you know, the beginning of my second and final year. And I, I was, I, the Juilliard program had been on my radar and I really, really wanted to go. And I had a thought, I was like, well, you know, I'm really not that prepared. Like I, I have been taking lessons. I've been practicing Baroque violin. I've been really working hard at it, but I, I just don't know if like I'm Juilliard prepared. So I thought, well, maybe I should take a year off. And then I went to my teacher at Manhattan school and she knew kind of tangentially that I, I was doing Baroque violin, but I don't think she realized like how serious I was about it. And I was terrified to tell her because not because I didn't think she'd take it well, but just because I'd never told her before. So I, I went to her and I said, hey, so I'm, I'm doing this thing and I, I'm really serious about it. And I want to go to Juilliard for Baroque violin. And I think I want to apply this year, but that is going to require me to, you know, be focused, putting a lot of my focus and attention on Baroque violin. And I just want to make sure you're okay with that. And her answer, she was so enthusiastic. She was like, oh my God, you absolutely have to do it. Like, it's so amazing. You have to play in studio class. You have to show everyone about Baroque violin because at Manhattan School of Music, it's also not really a thing there. Um, yeah, that so, must have been a real shock for you where your teacher was like incredibly supportive of you. You know, I know some teachers would be like, oh, like, let's take a step back. Like you've spent so much of your time on contemporary and then all of a sudden you want to make a switch, especially, you know, if you're, talking like in terms of career development and furthering your career in music, right? That's kind of a big shift in kind of like one year. So, yeah. um, so talk about that transition where you were focused on getting into Julia for the historical performance program. <laughs> it was like <laughs> that, that, I'm sure that's a loaded question. <laughs> oh my God, that year was absolutely insane. Um, yeah, but like I said, I mean, and also I wasn't necessarily shocked, you know, because she was a teacher who had been really supportive of me and, you know, what I wanted to do. And I think it was mostly just intimidating because yes, like you said, a lot of people have, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes they have preconceived notions of Baroque violin. Some people believe in historical performance, sometimes they don't. And I, I, like I said, I'd never talked to her about it, so I didn't really know what to expect. 
Um, but yeah, it was really, really wonderful. And so she was incredibly helpful in that, in that process. You know, she, uh, listened to me play all of my Baroque repertoire every week. Um, you know, she made sure that I doubled up on repertoire. So, you know, for my final recital at MSM, uh, and also I should say the administration was incredibly flexible as well. Um, they allowed me to play my final recital half on Baroque violin and half on modern. So the first half of my program was Bieber and Corelli. And the second half of my program was Ravel and a contemporary piece. Wow. So, was it Ravel Sonata? Yeah. Oh, okay. For, let's talk about that Ravel Sonata. I don't know about you, but that third movement is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's because like, <laughs> like, do you really have to torture us violinists, Ravel? Like, I, I know it's like all G-string and it's all 16 notes, but come on, man. <laughs> really? <laughs> I still have stress dreams about the last movement. I, I, deci I decided very early on that like once I heard that Ravel Sonata, I think I heard it in like a, I, I heard it for the first time in like a chamber class and I go, nope, not touching it, not touching it. <laughs> like the second movement, the blues is fine. It's great. It's fun. Oh, but that, I love that. Yeah, it's great. But then you, then you give us like, it's like a death sentence, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, it was so funny when I, when I uh, decided that I wanted to learn it. Um, you know, I knew about the last movement. I, I knew it was there, but it was kind of thing like, la, 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 like, I'll get to it when I get to it. So it's like, first movement, great. Second movement, so much fun. Third movement, all right, let's buckle in, guys. Let's go. And it took me, it took me a while. Like, I really sat down and, like, made sure that I practiced it super, super, super slowly. It's one of those things where you can't, you can't do it up to tempo until you've done it. Right. I would almost compare it to kind times. of, right. I would almost compare it to maybe, I don't know, maybe like the third movement of Barber Violin Concerto. Yeah. Like, you know, it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of random and you have like these triplets, you know, running triplets all over the place and you know, you're just, you're just going, you're, you're not stopping. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you mentioned Bach earlier, right. And, you know, I love Bach and I hope the, the listeners love Bach as well. And I have a question for you because you, you have experience in both the contemporary violin world and Baroque violin world. Would you, let's say, let's talk about like the partitas and the sonatas, the solo sonatas and partitas. Would you play the, the sonatas and partitas on Baroque violin the same as contemporary? And um, what, what are your thoughts on, um, what are your thoughts for contemporary violinists who kind of want to replicate that Baroque style but for some reason, just it's not working for them. Do you, do you have any suggestions? Do you have any like ideas about that? Absolutely. And um, I think it's very interesting because once I started, you know, actually playing on period instruments and I was taking lessons, uh, you know, I, I actually started out uh, when I was playing Bach, you know, period style. I was playing it on my modern violin, but with a broke bow. Um, and when you when you think about it, I mean, really, the only major differences between a modern violin, the object itself, and a broke violin are, you know, the strings, the bridge, basically just the way it sounds is a little different. The instrument itself, like, yeah, there there are some differences in how you approach it technically, but it's it's not like you're playing a completely different instrument. And the bow. So for me, changing my approach to Bach was really all about changing my approach to phrasing, um, changing my approach to how I played chords. Um, and I think my number one tip for modern violinists who are looking to um, add a more historical approach to their, to their Bach is to really learn more about where phrasing impulses come from in Baroque music. So just a couple of things, for example, um, strong versus weak beats. Um, a lot of things that I, I, you know, hear in, in modern interpretations of Bach is that everything is the same. It sounds very technical. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's not always this way, but I, you know, I have heard it before <laughs> and you know, the, the weak beats. So, you know, if, you know, pickups or 
if you were in three beat three, it, it, it can be very heavy. Um, and just to kind of think of it more as a flow and to have those strong and weak beats in mind, I think already will completely change the sound of your interpretation. Um, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, harmony also is a big one. Uh, Especially in Bach, really, right? Yeah. Bach is all yeah. about harmony. He's all about, it's not the traditional, you know, you know, one, five, one that we would see in the classical era, right? He, he loves mm -hmm. to play around with those harmonies, different chords and. Yeah. And dissonance going along with that, you know, tons of harmony. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and I think sometimes we, we want to shy away from them. Uh, at least, you know, when I was doing modern interpretations, I think that I wasn't necessarily focusing on the dissonances so much, but they're really the, the meat of, of the piece pieces. And so I think if you go towards the dissonances and really, you know, milk them, that's, uh, that's going to help. Uh, let me see. Here's a, here's a uh, question. Which out of the bot, out of the partitas and the sonatas, which one's your favorite? Hmm. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> that's a hard one. Oh my God. That's so hard. Okay. Let's, let's um, put it this way. How about one, uh, of the, like maybe grab one of the partitas and one of the sonatas, which ones could be your favorite? Okay. Um, because I can tell you what Augusta McKay Lodge uh, has said because I know you're friends with her, right? Yeah. Uh huh. She, we she, together. yeah, you guys went to school together. So she mm -hmm. says that she has this amazing connection with the third partita. Mm. And, um, for some reason I do too, you know, like, um, back when we were recording that episode, it was, we're still in like the peak of the pandemic during COVID-19 and there was still a lot of uncertainty, but for some reason that partita just helps us feel good. You know, and I think that's what we needed at that time. But yeah, anyways, I, what, what are your um, what are your thoughts? Which one would you say is your favorite? I think I think I can say with confidence that the um, C major sonata. The sonata. Favorite. Mm -hmm. I love. Yeah, I I love that fugue. You know, it's the hardest fugue, but I love playing it. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just such an interesting. Uh, interesting piece it's it's not quite like the others um and i i don't know i just i i really love um the the third movement is so beautiful um yeah so i think with confidence i can say with confidence a c major yeah, yeah i you know that first movement is also very interesting too because mm -hmm. you you know, you're starting off with this like kind of lamenting kind of feeling where you feel very tired in the beginning. And, um, but you still have a long, you know, obviously you're starting out, right? Like your grand scheme of things have like three, four more <laughs> movements to go. But I love, I love the way for some reason to me, like a masterclass in box writing is that, um, that connection between the first movement and that fugue. You know, is that a taka? For some reason, something is just so enlightening about that transition, and then you go you go straight into the C major fugue, and you know, and then you're you're off to the races. And for I think that was one of the fugues actually. Um, I maybe this is unofficially. I think Heifetz actually refused to perform that fugue. I don't. Yeah, because it was. Wow, I don't think I, think I knew was, that. <laughs> yeah, I think I heard this through like like passing by one of his pupils um, said that, yeah, he just refused to play that C major fugue and for good reason, because it's a hard fugue. But um, anyway, I think it's, the, the, by the way, the reason why I think it's tough is because it's hard to memorize, you know, it's hard yeah. to memorize. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that brings us to actually a very interesting part of the conversation where we're talking about fugues and I want you to talk about the setup of the Baroque violin because the way that we would do chords in fugues and box are certainly definitely different than we would do it on a Baroque violin. So 
can you talk about the strings? Can you talk about the, you know, the bridge setup um, and how you would approach those kinds of chords in Bach with your Baroque bow? Hmm. Um, so in general, the bridges on Baroque violins are flatter. Um, so it's much easier on the Baroque violin, I will say technically to have a seamless roll of a chord or however you want, it doesn't have to be a roll, but you know, it's, it's easier to get all the notes in the chord smoothly on a modern violin. You know, you hear a lot of like, da, da, <laughs> like a lot of, you know, like a, like a massive, ba, da, ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, you know, <laughs> right. Um, and I think my interpretation of a chord really breaks down to what are the important notes in the chord. And I don't mean that in terms of like which direction I, I break it in because I can't think of one time on the Baroque violin where I've felt necessary to break downward, you know? Um, I think that's one thing on, on modern violin that's kind I, of... Right, and I think that yeah. was a more of a, <laughs> I think that was a more of a 20th century idea where we have like yeah. violence from like sharing who, um, who actually wanted to do, you know, acknowledge that okay well even though the melody is at the bottom of the chord let's break it down so that way people can hear it but um i'll, I'll say the same thing as my professor in undergrad said people are going to people are going to hear that melody anyway so it doesn't right. make any sense to break downwards right right and um i mean in that situation what i would do is i would probably just sit a little bit longer on you know the area of the chord that had the melody in it and then just break there thereafter. <laughs> um, but you know, I don't think any any two chords really need to be the same. I think it's it's just like I said, based on what what in the chord is the most interesting. In general, in terms of like technique um, with with rolling chords, I like to think about sort of plucking the top note with the bow. Um, I think that that just in general makes it ring better. Uh, it encourages me to roll more evenly, more quickly. Um, when I, when I'm playing fast, that is, um, when I'm playing slow, I mean, there's so many, so many ways to roll a chord and to interpret a chord. Um, yeah. And I think that's where like know. the artistry comes in, right? You know, that's right. what differentiates you know, you playing Bach than me playing Bach, you know, it's just mm -hmm. that interpretation. Right. Um, and so I guess if, if we're, uh, you know, if I were to give like modern violinist advice in that department, it would be just, you know, play around with it, try to see how many different ways you can play a chord. Um, you know, how many different ways can you break it? How many different ways can you roll it? Um, how many different ways can you emphasize the juicy parts of it? Um, and that will really like help you expand your, your library of, <laughs> um, chord interpretations. Fabulous. I, I hope everybody's getting value out of all of this from Sarah. And if you like what you've heard so far, please make sure to subscribe, hit those notifications. So that way we continue providing value for all the violinists around the world. We talked briefly about Monteverdi. We talked about Bach. Bach is like the OG, right? When people think of Baroque, people think of Bach. However, you mentioned that there are also other composers out there that sometimes get neglected. You said Bieber, not the Justin Bieber. Okay, just want to make that clear. <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, Baroque Bieber, <laughs> I like to call him. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that you perform Bieber for your recital at MSM, is that correct? If I yeah. heard you right? Yeah. So, uh, Talk about the differences compositionally from like something like Bach to Bieber and do you, do you prefer one over the other or not so much? Uh, well, Bieber um, was much uh, earlier than Bach. So the, the sonatas that I played um, by Bieber, uh, well, the sonata that I played by Bieber at that time, the one that I referenced was, um, you know, published in 1681. Uh, and, you know, Bach wasn't born until 1685. So the, the style is, you know, Bach is very, it's very much, um, you know, contrapuntal. 
Um, it, it's a little bit more mathematical. Uh, Bieber is a little bit more, uh, I, I want to say rhapsodic, but I don't really know if that's quite the word. Um, but Bieber is a really fascinating composer. Um, he, he wrote a, a ton of music and uh, his music for the violin is really fascinating too. Um, his mystery sonatas are really excellent. Um, and those are, um, almost all of them are in Scordatura. There are a few that are not, um, but almost all of them are. Uh, and and I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Can you define what Scordatura is for the audience who's listening and has no idea what Scordatura is? Yeah, sure. So Scordatura is where the violin is tuned in a non-traditional way. So instead of being G-D-A-E, it could be um, G-G-A-E. I don't know. <laughs> Something <laughs> or, random like or, that. <laughs> or G-D-A-D, I think is um, a common one. Uh, you know, because it completely changes the, the resonance of the violin. Uh, and it makes certain tonalities sound more open on the violin. Um, I think one that Bieber likes a lot is tuning the G string up to an A um, because it, it helps um, make A major sound brighter. Um, so yeah, it, it's a very um, interesting uh, practice that I don't, I think after, you know, it, it's still used a lot in contemporary music, but um, you know, Bieber, he used it quite a lot. Um, yeah, and it's not it's not often times where you find scorgiatura on on violin. I mean, you would you would find a lot of cellists playing scorgiatura, and you I would say like a piece of music that has like weird tuning. I can say it's the so the second movement of Mahler four, where you have um you know you have that kind of like nasally violin sound. Um, where the entire violin has to be tuned up a half step. And um, yeah, I yeah. I remember I had to play that for an audition and that was, it, it messed up my ears because Ooh. I have, yeah. Well, like, they no, made like, you play, like, did they make you play other things too on the same instrument? No, 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 no. I brought two instruments to the audition. Oh, okay. I brought okay. two instruments okay. in. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was really funny because during that audition, people were like, oh yeah, they, they're smart like we i had there was a studio uh, person like another person in my studio who we shared the same instrument for this audition and they were like uh can we borrow that violin for, <laughs> for the audition <laughs> and we're like oh no it's our professor sorry <laughs> yeah i've seen um performances of like the beaver mystery sonatas where there's like you know a table full of violins that the performer has to rotate through because there's just no way like <laughs> you can't not to mention you know gut yeah. strings are they're the the tuning stability is not there no not they there would not, not be happy if you tried to pull that yeah <laughs> no them. and i yeah. you know it's very funny um uh in augusta mckay lodges episode i asked like about gut strings and our audience is familiar with what gut strings are, but is there like a certain type of gut that you like putting on your, on your, um, violin, like sheep gut or, um, um, so for me, it really depends on the season. It depends on my mood, <laughs> depends on like, on, uh, you know, what repertoire I'm playing. Um, I, I've cycled through a bunch of different brands and, you know, I'm always sort of experimenting with my setup to see what works best for a particular season. Um, you know, right now it's very humid. Um, so I'm currently, you know, playing around with what, uh, brands are going to work best right now. Like sometimes right. I sure. find, for example, like Toro. Um, is a brand of, of gut string that's pretty common. Um, it's not my favorite brand for me. Some people swear by it. It's not my favorite, but sometimes like I'll put a set of Toro on and I'm like, yes, this is absolutely it. And then a week later, I'm like, God, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's really strange, like depending on the weather, the humidity, some that will have a big effect on it. Um, Would you say that... that so, sorry, would you say that you would choose different brands of strings for different composers to play on? Not necessarily. I no? think, okay. um, like you would say like, uh, Bieber is like on my nerve. I'm going to put the most raw strings. I'm going to 
bang on the strings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, honestly, for me, uh, and, you know, maybe this isn't the most, like, historical approach, but I, I just go with whatever sounds the best. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for example, I use a Gimped Gut D, which is, um, it has, like, a, a little silver wire running through it, which is not, you know, really historic at all <laughs> yeah but, because you, you're, uh, you're playing with like a little bit of both like synthetic and gut i know that right. um like parastro passione strings they do a little bit of that they combine both mm -hmm. yeah and i i was using those on my modern violin for a long time actually um and i i still do and i i i was using a passione g for a while i've, I've switched to olive recently because i like the sound i've got a new violin two years ago, um, a Baroque mm. violin. So, um, and that also has a lot to do with it too, like the instrument, uh, you know, like the instrument that I, I was borrowing from Juilliard that I used for two years there behaved very differently than the instrument that I have now. Um, and so the strings that I preferred for that instrument are not necessarily the strings I prefer for this instrument. Um, so, and <laughs> I remember when I was first starting out in Baroque violin, I had no idea like what, gut strings to use. And I, I went to someone at a, a shop who sold gut strings and I was like, can you help me figure out what to get? And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I love it. It's like, I, you know, I'm you, so you clueless. Need to it Please out. help me. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I felt a little silly after that, but, uh, it, thinking back on it, I mean, yeah, it's kind of annoying and it's a bit expensive to, have to figure that out. But, you know, once you, have a collection of strings like I just have a pile of strings probably this high in my case that you know I don't they're not all used like some of them are broken in some of them are brand new some of them I put them on I played with it for a day and I was like this is not it and I took it off and I just put it aside because I maybe another time I'll pick it up and it will be the string that I I need so you know I think just having a collection and playing around with it it's fun um it's a good experiment yeah, I always love talking about strings to violinists and see what strings they use. I I've experimented with a lot of them. I've uh, I've used like the in the the pies. I've used the passiones. I've used the dominance. I've even went as cheap as like the tonicas because you know I was a broke college student, so I had to rely on tonicas. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I I love this conversation. But uh, going back to the composers. Um, which composers do you enjoy playing on Baroque? We've you've mentioned Bieber and Bach being like completely different musical languages, but which ones do you enjoy performing? Um, well, right now I'm in the middle of working on a project um, which is centered around the violin sonatas of um, Pandolfi Miali, uh, or Pandolfi, mm. just call him Pandolfi, um, who was also a 17th century composer. And I think the 17th century music for me, really, like, I'm very at home with that repertoire. Um, so, like, Bieber is included in that. Um, Corelli is included in that. Um, and Monteverdi is included in that. <laughs> Just, you know, there's so, so much repertoire uh, in the 17th century, and it's all so unique. And um, Pandolfi, specifically, he composed in um, the Stilus Fantasticus, which is a uh, you know, a very virtuosic kind of unpredictable, <clears throat> excuse me, style um, that a lot of composers at that time favored. But the reason why Pandolfi is so unique is I feel like it's just completely off the wall. Like it's totally, completely unpredictable. Um, and also at the, at the same time, a lot of what he writes is just incredibly beautiful. Um, and it, it can go from, you know, absolutely insane to you know calm and you know enchanting just in in a second and so that's why i enjoy it so much and i i think with that with that music um you know it, it's it's not there's it, there's not that many directions to it there's there's not like dynamics written everywhere there's not you know crescendos there, there's really none of that in baroque music <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, but it's it, not like we see in modern music, but right, yeah. uh, in, in 17th century music 
specifically, I feel like it's much more up to you as the performer to decide those things for yourself. And therefore there's even more artistic license that you can take with it and even more ways that you can make it your own. Um, so I'm working on a project right now uh, to record all of Pandolfi's Opus 4 sonatas um, for YouTube. We have one up already um, that was recorded last year and hopefully when things go back to normal, we'll have um, some more recordings go up and some more uh, performances uh, in public with those sonatas. But yeah, so th that's that's one in particular that I really enjoy. Um, but yeah, in general, the 17th century is just, I, I love it so much. And I feel very like, I think, uh, I really feel connected to it, I think because it's the first music that I played on oh, okay. the Baroque violin. So I think that's sort of why I feel so close to it. Um, mm -hmm. But also just because it's fun. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, I to be honest, I don't know much about Pandolfi, so I'll have to search him up a bit. Um, it's really fun. Really fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Renaissance music is completely underrated. I think that there's a lot of great music in the, in the Renaissance area. And, you know, you're dealing with a very specific niche. And I want to transition into, you know, taking advantage of that niche and making it a career. Because, you know, Baroque violin, I think it's an up and coming niche. You know, we've we have more historical performance programs being popped up around the country and around the world. There's more scholarship than ever before on composers like Pandolfi, like Bieber, like Bach. And, you know, there's con there's always going to be new scholarship being thrown out every year. So um, it's becoming a popular niche. And I, I want to know your thoughts on navigating your career in this niche. Um, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of, you know, being a broke violinist? Um, well, I think the advantages, I mean, there's so many advantages. Uh, I think, you know, having a niche and something that you uh, specialize in, it's always it's always a good thing. It's never a bad thing uh, because there are, the more you niche down, the more opportunities you have. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I didn't pick, I didn't go into Baroque violin because, you know, I thought, oh, I'll get more jobs this way. Like that was not what right. drove that decision. Yeah. Like I'll become um, a millionaire if I become a Baroque violinist. <laughs> right. Like so, questionable, although it can't. <laughs> hey, you never know. Maybe you'll be the first person who can make that happen. You know, never say never. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. But um, yeah. So that's that's not why I went into it. But it just so happens, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I'm getting the best of of all of the worlds. You know, I'm an orchestra player. I'm a chamber musician. I'm a soloist. Like I, I do all of these things and. You know, I think in the modern world, you know, there is there's all this pressure like you have to be an orchestra player or you have to be a chamber player or you're a soloist. And it's not to say that you can't combine those things into a modern career. I know many people do, but, um, you know, I think it just comes more inherently that that combination comes more inherently with, you know, playing Baroque music. Um, and so, you know, one day I'll, I'll get to play a Handel opera. And then the next day I'll get to go, um, you know, play my Pandolfi sonatas in a recital. And then the next day I'll get to go play Mozart quartets on period instruments. Like it, it's really just so cool how I get to combine all these things um, in my work every day. Uh, and in terms of disadvantages, I honestly don't really think there are any. The only thing I would say is I, I guess that sometimes I kind of miss playing my modern violin a little bit <laughs> like right yeah there's like oh you know, well it's sitting there i mean but i kind of don't miss you i'm gonna go do this thing <laughs> you know it was funny i i was um i was packing up uh to to move a couple of weeks ago and i i was um going through all of my i i decided i wanted to put some stuff in storage and so i was going through all of my my sheet music and i was looking at all of the stuff that i haven't touched in ages like i was going through my concertos that i played in college and grad school and i'm like ooh, Dvorak concerto ooh, like Degon, oh cool and I, I like took some stuff out i was like maybe i'll read through this this summer and try to you know <laughs> get my, my chops on modern back but um 
you know, so that, that's really the only thing I would say is I, I do kind of miss like wailing away, like <laughs> sometimes, but like, honest, I want I, sound now and I will get it. <laughs> but to be honest, like you, you can, you know, wail away on a, a Baroque violin too. You can get really down in there. And oh yeah. It, it, like the Vivaldi yeah. seasons on Baroque instruments is a clear example of that. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah. And so I, I would just say, I guess it's, you know, there's certain repertoire, you know, beyond perhaps Brahms that I don't get to play as much anymore. Like I have played Brahms on period instrument. I've played Mendelssohn on period instruments. And um, so I do get to play late repertoire quite a bit, but it's, it's, you know, beyond that. Like I really miss Prokofiev <laughs> sometimes and um, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, like I, I can only imagine doing the second movement of Prokofiev one sonata on a, on a period instrument. <laughs> like <laughs> bum, bum, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. No, th thanks for sharing your thoughts on that because, you know, we don't have, I, you know, you're, you're the second Baroque violin that I've interviewed on the podcast and I hope to have many more. So I, hopefully this will inspire someone listening to uh, this podcast to start Baroque violin. Honestly, I think it's a, it's a great niche. It's um, should be talked about more, but I, I so do too. And yeah. sorry, no, no, go ahead. No, you, <laughs> I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think a lot of people, they, they see it as one or the other, like, um, you know, if I'm a modern violinist, you know, I can't really like do Baroque because then it's a whole thing. But I think that you can inform your playing in a way that, you know, really the, the, the thing that I, I think is uh, most important for a modern player who's looking to get into the Baroque niche is to figure out how to do it on your modern violin because it's not that far off, you know, technically. You can, you can make the sound, you can, um, like you can replicate the sound, um, you can create the impulse. And so it's, 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 it's fun and you don't have to, you know, buy gut strings and a Baroque bow to sound informed, I guess. Sure, of course. And you very clearly talk about your love for Baroque violin and your love for food on Instagram. You have- yes. You know, you have over, what is it, 10,000, 12,000 followers, and you get to share your journey and uh, your recipes because, you know, my wife is a big foodie as well. And she has, she's actually turned me into a foodie, honestly. Like, I, you could just give me, like, maybe four years ago, you could give me, like, any food, I'll just eat it. But now I'm like, <laughs> my palate has now <laughs> been more refined as, uh, thanks to her. So talk about your love for food. Talk about, you know, your your food blog, The the Hunger Musician, and how you plan on kind of combining both, you know, your passions for music and food together. Uh, so I've had my blog for about 10 years now. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I mean, my love for food and my love for music, they've always been connected. Um, and so my, my goal with my blog has always been and will always be to, um, you know, make that connection for people. Um, many, most of my followers actually on Instagram are musicians. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a big goal of mine to, you know, reach them in a way that helps them to enjoy food and the creativity of food, just like they enjoy being creative on their instruments. Um, for me, they really feed each other, you know, pun half intended. Uh, <laughs> like when I'm creative in the kitchen, I feel more creative on my instrument. When I'm creative on my instrument, I feel more creative in the kitchen. And I think it's really important for people with creative professions to have multiple creative outlets. And it just so happens that food is also necessary. We have to eat it to live. And so how cool that you can take this necessity and turn it into a hobby and a you know, way to be creative. Um, so that's sort of what my blog is all about. Um, and I, I just, I really enjoy it. And it's, it's a nice way to tie everything that I do all together. All right. So here's, let me ask you this. So out of the top of your head, what is one recipe that you absolutely love that I can incorporate in today's lunch? <laughs> today's lunch? Yes. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. What do you have on hand? Maybe I can, maybe I can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I kind of don't know what I have in my refrigerator. That's, that's my wife's job. I haven't cooked it in a long time. <laughs> but um, no, but you, you have like amazing recipes. Like um, I, I saw just like oh, just a simple pizza. It was a simple pizza with like arugula on it, but it looked so tasty. And um, and I've always believed that you can't play well if you don't feel well. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't play yeah. well if you don't feel well. You can't play well if you don't eat well. I guess you could also argue that too, um, but yeah, yeah. But let's share share like a favorite recipe of yours that you kind of uh, that you enjoy making. Um, totally well, not related to violin, but I <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, I, actually, I think it is very related to violin oh, for okay. me at least. Um, you know, like when I like I said, when I'm in the zone creatively in the kitchen, and when I'm feeding myself well, when I'm eating well, like that is when I feel the most productive, um, the most creative on my instrument. Um, and so, uh, gosh, it's really so hard to just pick one. Um, but, uh, or how about something that you recently made within the last week? Within the last week? Well, I made, um, uh, the other day I made mango salsa. You can see the, uh, the videos. Oh, I'm on that. Okay. (laughs) I'm on it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which is, you know, it's nothing special, but, you know, for me, it's those very simple things that aren't fussy. They don't take a lot of time, but it's just simple, fresh ingredients that go together so well um, that I just, I really enjoy that kind of thing. And um, one of my favorite things to do in the kitchen, it's like a challenge that I set for myself. And I think it's, you know, really taught me a lot about cooking over the years is going into my fridge and saying, what's here, what can I make out of this, and kind of just riffing. Um, so I, I would say it's not a particular recipe, but just that action has not only made me a better home cook, but it's, you know, really helped me to uh, explore my creative options in the kitchen. Um, and I think, you know, what you said before about when you you feel well, you play well, is like such a huge thing that I'm always trying to hammer home uh, on my, on my blog and on my Instagram. Uh, and you know, the whole reason why I started the blog 10 years ago was because I had just finished my freshman year of college and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling my best. You know, I had spent every day, every single day, you know, when I wasn't in class, I was in the practice room and I had basically just moved my whole life. I had gone from being a high school student to now I was at a conservatory or a conservatory environment and I was going to make the most of it. And I finished that year and I, you know, I had really only been eating junk food and, you know, I wasn't really taking care of myself. And I realized like, this is not helping me. And I, I realized that, you know, I was spending all this time in the practice room, but I wasn't getting exponentially better. And I was like, well, why? (laughs) Um, and so, you know, when I started my blog, that's really when I started taking care of myself better. I was, um, you know, making time to meal prep. I was making time to relax. I was making time to exercise. And, um, I really believe that they're all interconnected and I magically, even though I was spending less time, well, it's not really magic, but I was spending less time in the practice room physically, but I was getting better faster. Yes. So, I, I believe in that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so and I, I, again, I was very young at the time. Like I was, I just finished my freshman year of college. So I was learning all of these lessons, like, you know, quality over quantity in the practice room, sure, um, of course. how yeah. to take care of myself as an adult. <laughs> but, you know, in general, I think that, you know, these are reminders that anyone can benefit from, which is that, you know, you don't have to necessarily sacrifice a, a delicious meal to, achieve your goals on a particular day in the practice room like perhaps it's that taking that time to have the meal instead of you know forcing yourself into the practice room will actually be the thing that you need to approach your instrument with you know sound body and mind and to really like be able to focus yeah and we all fall into that trap right we're like oh like i i could eat lunch, but I need to practice for my audition, or I need to practice for orchestra rehearsal, or I need to practice for my recital. And actually, as a matter of fact, I'm a huge believer in this too. And I teach this to my students. I have a lot of young students, the beginners uh, mostly. And 
what I what I tell them is like, imagine that this song is just a colorful salad, and we have different pieces that we want to, you know, we got, you know, it's also to you know encourage them to eat healthy, right? Because maybe mom and dad <laughs> are like trying, and I could help, like, oh, actually, good music is good food too, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, like, there's a, you know. You, Yellow, green, red. There's all sorts of colors that we can apply to like Suzuki "Song in the Wind," right? <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, yeah, and I I totally believe in that. And I think that it's better to get like a good night's sleep and a lot of good food in your system, so that way you can actually focus more. So you could focus on the crafts as opposed to like mindlessly practicing day in and day out to you know because you're not you're not doing yourself any good. Essentially, you know, it's better to get like one hour of quality practice and three hours of wasteful practice, in in my opinion. Especially like well, ab- espe- absolutely, yeah. Especially like if you're a conservatory student, right, where your time is so valuable, right? If you're, you're if yeah. first of all, if you're getting f- like six hours of practice in conservatory and you're like, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, and I would love for you to leave a comment down below on how you do it because I'm so interested. <laughs> like we're all so busy running around, uh, yeah. You know, of and course, it's, it's also, different now because, you know, COVID, but. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it's also, you know, like, and I, I realized this the hard way in college as well, you know, after my first year, that's not good for your body. You know, that amount of playing. And by the way, this was, you know, excluding, it was six hours a day, excluding orchestra and chamber music. So I was also playing those things on top of that. I was basically every waking minute that I wasn't in class, I was trying to practice. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's great to have that motivation and that drive, but at a certain point you're risking your, you know, joint health, <laughs> you're of risking course, your mental yeah. health. Of um, course. And so I, I learned that the hard way with, I, I was not seriously injured, but I, I did have an injury my second year in college that, um, you know, it was kind of a wake up call. I was like, I don't think that that was healthy for me. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And I, I, I just want to say like, I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect either. Like there are nights when I come home from teaching a full day, you know, in, in non COVID times. And I, I'm like, I, I was going to make dinner tonight and I just don't have the energy. So I'm going to have scrambled eggs and like, that's fine. And that's but okay. At least, yeah. Like taking for me, taking 15 minutes, if scrambled eggs is what I want to eat for dinner, you know, me taking that 15 minutes to like, okay, let's calm down. Let's just like make a Decompress nice little thing. Then. And then we'll practice. Even that, just like taking that 15 minutes is like, okay, I'm ready now. (laughs) Wonderful. And I think that's a great way to finish off the podcast, to be honest with you, because you have offered such valuable advice, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, sharing your thoughts on food, Baroque violin. And I hope to have you on the podcast again, and hopefully in person when when we're all kind of done with all this craziness. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Jane Kenner, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Violin Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to subscribe, hit those bell notifications for future episodes of the podcast. And Sarah, thank you so much again. Thank you, Eric.